everyone. It's about 10 and 40 miles from Simon and Kerry, or so we don't. Decide by reading a letter sent to us by the governor. Uh, dear councilors, dated June 24th, about three weeks ago. I am pleased to uh, nominate Sylvia Gomes to the position of Associate Justice of the Juvenile Court. I submit this nomination for the advice and consent of the Executive Council pursuant to Part 2, Chapter 2 of the Constitution of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. I am enclosing the nominee's resume for your convenience. Sincerely, Charles D. Baker. So let me start the hearing. Uh, first of all, let me introduce uh, the councils that are here, um, both physically and by, by web. So uh, to my far right, uh, Councillor Terence Kennedy. Good morning. Councillor Robert Juvenville. Good morning. To my left, Councillor Marilyn Petito Devaney. Good morning. On the webinar, we have Councillor Duff and Councillor Hurley. So that makes one, two, three, four, five, six. Um, I haven't heard from Councillor Ionella. Does anyone know if he's going to attend either way? I believe he is. He'll, he'll be here? Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll just introduce him when he comes. Um, but let me start the hearing by, by uh, saying this. Um, there was some talk with uh, the nominee and myself and all these wonderful people that wrote a tremendous amount of letters on whether or not we should have someone live come in to testify. I personally made a decision not to let that happen. Um, I think everything in life is a risk and balance, and I didn't want anyone ever to get sick or be fearful of getting a disease to come in and testify. So I personally made the decision not to have live testimony. Instead, um, the nominee has some very good friends and very good, <laughs> very good um, um, people that uh, wrote tremendous letters. I could read these letters uh, for the next two hours, but I won't. Um, I think the person that uh, wanted to come the most was uh, just newly retired Judge Lawrence Monis, who served incredibly well for decades in the juvenile court. That's the one letter I will read in, just to uh, get the process started. Um, and other than that, I'll just tell you who else wrote letters. They'll all be in the record for review. Counsel is, um, unless you want me to read every letter. Did you get copies of letters? We only got one yeah. letter. Okay. One letter. I'll make all these available. So over the How next many week, letters did you get? We only got one. I got probably about seven or eight. I'll tell you who they're from, and I'll make them. I'll make copies for you so you can have them during the week. Is that okay? All right. Thank you. Um, so let me just start off. Uh, can you can you tell us first who the letters are from? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Let me read uh, Larry Monis's Judge Monis's letter, and then I'll tell you who the other letters are from, and uh, and they'll be in the record, and we can make copies for all, all the counselors. Um. Dear counselors, I write this letter in support of Judge Nominee Gomes in lieu of appearing before you, which I would much prefer, but given COVID-19 restrictions, it is more appropriate that I use this written method to offer my support for Ms. Gomes and to encourage you in the strongest terms to endorse her nomination. I have been an Associate Justice in the Juvenile Court since June 25, 2008, and after submitting to mandatory retirement in May 2017, I was most fortunate to be approved as a recall judge although I am currently suspended like most other judges due to the economic crisis. Prior to serving as a judge, I started work in the juvenile court as a lawyer on February 8, 1982, my very first day as a lawyer. I believe in what the juvenile court can do to help children and families in crisis. That belief drives my desire and there be good people on the juvenile bench, people knowledgeable of the law and sensitive to an understanding of the life situation and the many needs, most often of the disadvantaged children and families served by that court. That belief in my experience informs my support of Ms. Gomes and, and observations that follow. Judge nominee Gomes fits very well my perception of who should be a juvenile court judge. And knowing that she well, well, may, well may be our next juvenile court judge reaffirms my optimism that the juvenile court will continue to do its good work for our litigants. For the time that I was assigned in New Bedford about six years ago, Ms. Gomes appeared before me almost on a daily basis for multiple cases in both evidentiary and non-evidentiary proceedings. I also had a few cases with her when I was practicing law. I've had more than ample opportunity to assess her knowledge of the law, her trial skills, her worth, ethic, and her demeanor. All are highly impressive, making her, in my opinion, worthy of your consideration. The demands on a juvenile court judge are unique. Presiding over care and protection cases, a very large percentage of the cases done in juvenile court requires review both before non-evidentiary hearings and during and after trial of thousands and thousands of pages of social worker reports, clinical evaluations, medical records, treatment records, and relevant materials. I heard a case in the last several years that had 1,600 pages of medical records alone. 
A decision is expected 30 days after trial, and findings of fact and conclusions of law, usually numbering in the hundreds of paragraphs, are expected in a reasonable time thereafter. My observation of Ms. Gomes supports the conclusion that she has the work ethic that is second to none, and she is equal to the formidable responsibility. Further, I have observed not only has she always been prepared, but has remarkable factual retention, a quality that will allow her, as a judge, to present knowledgeable of the specific aspects of the case before her, making the litigates, litigants in that case realize their case and their issues are important to her, therefore affording respect and dignity to those litigants. Simply stated, she will make them feel like their case is important to her. She has a commanding understanding of the law. In my court, her area of expertise has been in care and protection cases. She knows statutory and case law and is quick and efficiently able to apply the doctrines of law to the facts of the case at hand. She has excellent knowledge of the rules of evidence, which will allow her, as a judge, to quickly and properly apply those rules as to objections made. As to other common types of cases, including child requiring assistance petitions and substance abuse petitions, those cases often have overlapping legal principles with care and protection cases, and she will make that transition easily. Her skill and ability to convince me that she will have no issues with delinquency proceedings. A judge should also be possessed of respectful, calm temperament. In the juvenile court especially, the nature of the case is that parents and children, if old enough to be involved, such as child requiring assistance, are highly emotional charged and understandable response proceedings where the perception is the judge holds the power to interfere with or even terminate custody of your children. Ms. Gomes has demeanor and temperament that could serve as, temp as a template for the juvenile court. She is always highly professional, courteous, and respectful to all in the courtroom, regardless of the action or the heightened emotion that may sometimes occur. She recognizes and appreciates the role of other members of the courtroom ca cast, the clerks, probation officers, and court officers. Our cases deal with people who have a myriad of issues being battered partners, suffering from substance abuse addiction, mental health issues, and other disadvantages. I have observed that she always, without exception, has been respectful to those individuals, cognizant of their plight of their lives and their humanity. She would use the sensitivity and compassion to create a proper courtroom atmosphere where people feel respected. But I am also of the strong opinion that those characteristics would not interfere with her ability to maintain decorum and propriety in courtroom, creating an appropriate forum. She has the ability to strike that balance. I have never socialized with Ms. Gomes and know very little of her personal life. What I have observed indicates that she is a person of integrity and high moral character. I do know she talks with great pride of her daughter, and I have a fond memory of how she fretted when her daughter first went off to college. She understands family. In sum, it is my opinion that Judge Nominee Gomes is worthy of your highest consideration. I truly believe she will be a tremendous asset to the juvenile court bench, and she will serve the people needing the court and the Commonwealth well. She will inspire confidence in our court and advance the cause and purposes of that court. Thank you for considering my input. Should you have any questions, please do not hesitate to contact me. Respectfully, Lawrence Monis, Associate Justice on Recall of the Massachusetts Juvenile Court. Counselor? Yes. If I may, um, as the only counselor here who voted for um, Judge Monis, I just want to say that um, it, it was uh, my honor. And uh, I, he, I'm sorry that people have to, uh, great people like him have to retire at 70. We really have to change that. And um, 12 years ago, I voted for him. Very and, um, you know, out of all the attributes I look for, especially in a juvenile court, is um, compassion, empathy and compassion. And he has it. He really does. So his letter means a lot to me. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that input, Counselor. Um, next, and again, I'm not going to read these verbatim, but I might, maybe might paraphrase a sentence or two out of them. Um, from the lawyers of Dana Sargent, who called me personally, um, he's a lawyer in New Bedford. I am writing in support of Sylvia Gomes. She has a reputation for being tough when necessary. She's ready to litigate when needed. She is realistic and willing to talk about a case and make settlements when appropriate. I have no doubt she'll be an excellent judge. So again, I'll have all these letters. I got an, an email from Mary Ann Rogers. I would like to express my reason why I support Sylvia Gomes. Mary Briggs Educational Club members and Cape Verdean Recognition Committee. Sylvia is committed and a dedicated member. For the Martha Briggs Educational Club, she has chaired successfully the Scholarship Committee for a few years. On the Cape Verdean Recognition Committee, she has been the clerk of the Board of Directors. She is focused, keeps us on track, and is detail-oriented. She is diligent and hardworking and does not take her commitment lightly. From Linda Hickney, I am sure that letters like this typically come from people holding higher positions of influence, power, or respect. 
I would imagine it to be a rare occurrence to receive a letter of recommendation from a secretary for a judicial appointment. If, my, if I am correct, then I hope this letter will stand out as a rarity. I write with the sincerest of hearts and the most sincere manners about the type of individual I've known for 18 years. Attorney Sylvia Gum, simply put, stands out amongst her peers. She's an individual possessing all qualities necessary to become a, not only a judge, but a truly great judge. When an attorney or party comes to the most unfortunate type of cases so commonly known to the juvenile court, all will be impacted by appearing before her. Naturally, all parties cannot leave the courtroom with their desired end results. But surely, with Judge Gomes on the bench, parties will leave with a feeling they have been clearly heard and carefully considered. And the letter goes on and on how she's been a judicial secretary uh, for a lot of years. And uh, it goes on for a couple of pages. But she says, uh, thank you for your time spent in reading this letter from the secretary. Not your usual, I know. But then again, neither is Attorney Sylvia Gomes. So we thank um, Ms. Hickney for her letter. I have a letter from Gail Forts. I'm writing you in support of the nomination of Sylvia Gomes, a judge in our region. I have known Sylvia for several, several years working through my work at the YMCA. Sylvia was awarded a YMCA Woman of Distinction Award for her dedication in eliminating racism and empowering women. Sylvia strives for excellence in everything she does. She is involved in her community as a strong advocate for gender and racial equality. She always leads by example. This is signed by Gail Forts, the executive, executive director of the YMCA in Southeastern Massachusetts. I have a letter from Jillian Ellis, an attorney. I am ready to support the nomination of Sylvia Gomes. I had the pleasure of knowing Sylvia since I was a baby lawyer in 2007. I was fresh out of law school when I met Sylvia. She was front and center to welcome me. In 2009, I opened my own law practice in Obep and have represented parents and children in care and protection cases in the Obep Juvenile Court. Sylvia Holmes and I have had hundreds of cases together. Sometimes our position on behalf of our, our clients were aligned and we work closely to achieve a common outcome. More often, our positions on behalf of our clients could not be more far apart. I have testified for Attorney Gomes as a court investigator for a few occasions. Juvenile court is the most emotional, sensitive, and heart-wrenching areas of the law. It is always hotly contested by litigants. Tempers and emotions are inflamed due to the sensitive nature. It is not enough to be a good lawyer in juvenile court. You must have the passion for the work and the right to meet him. Attorney Gomes always treats all counsel and litigants kindly, fairly, and with respect. Attorney Gomes has intense and consistent worth ethic. She is routinely one of the first lawyers in the courtroom every morning. She's the last people to leave the DCF office each day. Many times she works after hours. She's constantly prepared and organized. I am the co-president of the Massachusetts Juvenile Bar Association. We hold training conferences each year. Attorney Gomes is not only the DCF lawyer of one or more handful in the audience. She's constantly strived to learn more things and update her skills. Her work ethic and commitment to continuing education will serve well on the bench. I appreciate the time you took to read correspondence. I also have a letter that I received just yesterday uh, from Antonio Cabral, state representative uh, in New Bedford. I am writing in support of the appointment of my constituent, Sylvia Gomes. I have known Sylvia for many years. Sylvia bears all the qualifications required of a successful juvenile court judge. Due to her extensive work with victims of domestic violence and care and protection and those physically abused, Sylvia has demonstrated a commitment to fair and compassionate leadership. She is proven and highly knowledgeable leader who will honor the office and address each case with dignity and respect. For over 25 years, she has made it her career protecting children, strengthening families, and protecting our community. She has been an active member on the commissioner as a commissioner of the Bristol County Commission on Status of Women, working to advance equity for women in all facets of life and promote rights and opportunities for all women. Previously, she's also a member on the South Coast Reentry Collaborative, charged with creating a more coordinated reentry of inmates released from the Bristol County House of Corrections. I'm confident she'll be an outstanding addition and asset to our court system. Counselor, yes. um, I'd like to add to that um, someone else that was supporting. Please um, do. Uh, first of all, um, I, for the record, uh, a woman called me and she also called the other counselors. And she told me that she was looking forward to um, being a witness. She wanted to be a witness. And attorney Gomes called her to say that the um, that the um, a presiding counselor uh, is not going to allow witnesses, but he did allow Miss uh, Gomes Ms. Gomes to have two people come in attendance. Again, 
Um, I just want to say for the record, uh, George Cronin, God rest his soul, our late executive secretary of the governor's council, who was a governor's council counselor um, in the 60s. He advised me that the agenda was adopted about 60 years ago. And um, I just want to add a past council, the only one who is still on the council is Council Ionella and myself. And we met, the council met, and we, um, a long discussion, and we anonymously agreed to continue the established agenda, the protocol, no changes. Um, the district councilor who, who presides can suggest how many witnesses and how many family or friends they can bring. But I have to say on the record, I ran for this position to bring more transparency that was needed on the governor's council. And I am not in favor of banning witnesses. A witness comes to recommend the nominee, but most importantly, to answer questions from the council. And so um, that's the agenda. And uh, I, had not, I had no notice that this was going to be one person making that decision. And so it is, and, um, but um, it, it, isn't, uh, it isn't what this council had um, voted for to change the agenda and not to have witnesses. And that is part of our agenda. It is on the agenda. We have who is for, and we have the witnesses for, and then we ask who is opposed. So I just want to put that in the record that um, I um, respectfully oppose that we don't have a witness yet, and rightfully so, um, a couple of people have come, members, uh, uh, friends, family, of the nominee can attend, but yet a witness can't. So I just want to put that in the record, and I respectfully um, submit that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, yeah, Councilor Kennedy, go ahead. Uh, I appreciate what Councilor Devaney is saying, but I, I, with respect to transparency, since this pandemic has happened, we've become more transparent than we ever have been because our hearings are now posted and our assemblies are now posted on YouTube uh, and open to the public. Prior to, the, prior to these issues coming up, uh, they were recorded, but somebody would have to physically come in and ask for them. Whereas now anybody can get access to, the, to it on the internet. So we're being more transparent than we've ever been. Uh, with respect to witnesses, I certainly like to have witnesses here on hearings, but we are in extraordinary times. Um, there's a pandemic going on. And what all the medical professionals have said, and we happen to have one in the room today, is the nominee's daughter, she's an infectious disease specialist, health care worker. Um, They've all said that the fewer people that are in the room, the fewer people that are exposed to each other, the less likely it is that someone's going to get sick. We're not just dealing with this in the governor's council. The legislature is meeting remotely. Um, uh, I know that I, and I'm sure uh, Council Juvenile has spent quite a bit of time um, doing court hearings in a very unusual manner, sometimes over the phone and sometimes uh, through uh, Zoom or other electronic means in order to protect people from getting infected. So it, while no, under normal circumstances, I agree with you 1,000%. We want people sitting there. We want live witnesses that we can ask questions of. But we're in extraordinary times because of the pandemic. Uh, and I think that uh, safety trumps all. And I think it's important that uh, uh, we limit the number of people that come here as much as we can. We, we're not meeting in our own chamber. We're socially distancing as best as we can. Um, our chamber is too small, obviously. Two of the counselors that are potentially at high risk uh, are, are there significant others who are at high risk are, um, are um, coming in by uh, WebEx for personal safety. And I think for the personal safety of the witnesses, of the counselors, and everybody else that's in this room, a very limited number of people, I support the fact that we're doing it by letters. Maybe in the future we can talk about having witnesses come on, on WebEx. That's a possibility. There's no reason that other people can't join the meeting and testify by WebEx. But I do support limiting exposure at this point. Thank you, Councilor Kennedy. Councilor Duvino. I echo uh, Councilor Kennedy's uh, statements and his concerns. 
I don't think anybody today uh, doesn't agree with the fact that every extra body here puts us more in a position of getting this terrible disease. So I, I, I applaud the council of Fall River. Oh, for no witnesses, we have plenty of letters here. People are seeing what's going on. I'd also ask the council from Watertown for any criticism of the council. We should probably do it in our uh, chain of our offices rather than uh, at the council in front of, uh, in front of everybody to have a personal criticism. But I thank the council from Fall River for keeping people down here. Thank you, Council Juneville. I appreciate that. Um, and just for the record, we didn't take any official votes on how to do anything. Um, years back, there were no witnesses at all, ever. Um, so it's up to the host council on how to run a meeting. And this is my decision. I take full responsibility for it. Nothing to do with you. I did uh, say the two people that you live with can come to the meeting, <laughs> and that's it. <laughs> so um, I'll give you an opportunity um, to, to introduce Council Ferrara, before uh, we no, start, no, 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 no. point of information. Let me finish. Let me finish. Um, I'm going to read. Uh, I'm going to read into uh, into the record uh, another letter. Uh, two more letters. Again, just paraphrase. Um, I got one from Estelle Ribeiro. It is much enthusiasm that I like to support Sylvia going to the appointment of judgeship. I have known Sylvia for 20 years. 18. I have had the pleasure of working with her in the juvenile court. Sylvia will be the judge who exhibits that duality. Intuitively, she gets it. I have observed Sylvia be prepared, thorough, professional, and forever fair on professional and personal levels. She is a single parent and has raised a remarkable young lady who is a top achiever at New Bedford High School. Congratulations. Subsequently, her daughter went on to enter Smith College. I first became aware of Sylvia's daughter when she applied for the Martha Briggs Educational Scholarship. Her daughter's submission was unanimous, first picked in 2012. Sylvia is so appreciated. She comes with knowledge to include service as a probation officer, as an assistant district attorney, and most recently as a DCF attorney, where she is a standout in care and protection in the Bedford Juvenile Court. She's a committed public servant to helping others. She has the patience and I believe that will display a judicial temperament of balancing holding parties accountable when necessary to ensure public safety and recognizing that good people make bad mistakes and are deserving of a second chance. She's an active and engaged member of her community. And she goes on and on. Finally, Sylvia moves adeptly in a multitude of environments. I am most impressed by her ability to be inclusive in a multicultural environment. Her keen awareness of social, cultural, and socially emotional dynamics give her an understanding of the plight of the community at large, thereby prompting her, response, her to respond appropriately and accordingly to the needs of children and families. Thank you for providing me with this opportunity. And this is Estelo Ribeiro, who's a retired probation officer. And lastly, I think the last letter I'm going to read uh, in is from Cynthia Rose, who is a retired assistant clerk magistrate and a retired police officer. I have known Sylvia in many capacities of being a police officer for 22 years and a retired clerk magistrate in the Bedford Third District Court. I have seen her professional career on many levels. My first dealing has been with the when she was a probation officer in the Third District Court. She would be someone I would go to as a police officer for guidance while still wanting a defendant to try to do the right thing. It was my feeling that we all help someone to be a better person, and having the knowledge of the court as a PO Gomes did made it a much better outcome. Once she became an attorney, our past did cross while she was working for the DA's office. She did help in so many ways for the best possible scenario for myself as a police officer and also for the defendant. Her expertise and advice always seemed to be the right decision for any case that we had together. Once becoming an assistant clerk magistrate, we did not have any cases together because she was now working for the Department of Children and Families. My connection with the juvenile court in New Bedford was strong and I could go into the courtroom and watch attorney Gomes while she argued and conducted trials. Her preparedness far exceeds any other person I've known throughout my career. The disposition that she always maintained was one that would exemplify a true professional in every sense of the word. My support for Sylvia Gomes is overwhelmingly the highest it could be for her to become Judge Sylvia Gomes. The Commonwealth of Mass would be honored to have her as part of this very unique group and she will always shine and become a beacon for the most prestigious position. We are now living in a world that needs more caring people in such a profession to see that everyone gets justice that they deserve. And I truly believe she is the right person. And I'm just so proud to have her as my friend and a very respected jurist. And I just remember that this morning, I got, uh, I got a uh, email from um, another judge. I hope all is well. This is from Judge Tracy Sousa, uh, who's in the juvenile court in Taunton mostly. Just wanted to send some thoughts regarding Sylvia 
or a governor's council hearing. I have known and worked with her for tw over 20 years. She's one of the hottest workers I know. She also is kind and compassionate. Her background is impeccable, truly one of a kind, exclamation point. She will serve the juvenile bench very well, and I look forward to her having her as a col colleague. Take care and stay well. I also heard from Judge Harrington, who is a justice in the juvenile court in uh, New Bedford Fall River, and also the presiding judge, Judge Spinelli, uh, who spoke extremely uh, favorable, and it looks forward uh, to having you on the bench of this council to see that you're a fit candidate. And with that being said, Sylvia, I'm going to give you the opportunity to introduce your two guests, and then we'll hear from you. Good morning. Uh, my daughter, Ariel, is uh, sitting there, and my significant other, Randall. Um, I'm very appreciative of the fact that they came today. Welcome. Nice to meet you. All right, we'll hear from you. Oh, uh, wait, any, any other, uh, no one's here in opposition, I assume, because I don't see anyone else in the crowd unless one of the camera guys, no? All right. You sure you don't want to testify, right. guys? So we're going we're gonna to close that part of the hearing. There'll be no more, there'll be no more testimony, and now we're going to hear from you. Thank you. Good morning. I come before you humbled and honored. I would like to thank each member of the Governor's Council for your time and consideration. Each of you took the time to speak, ask questions, and discuss my nomination with me prior to today. I appreciate the time you afforded me. I recognize the tremendous responsibility of this governing body, and I am thankful for this opportunity. I would like to specifically thank Council Ferreira for sharing my hearing and for his time, patience, and guidance. I thank Governor Baker and Lieutenant Governor Polito for nominating me for the position of Associate Justice for the Juvenile Court. Thank you, member, thank you to the members of the JNC for their professionalism during the vetting process, and specifically thank you to Lauren Green Petrino, the Executive Director of the JNC, and the Governor's Legal Counsel, Robert Ross. Present with me today, as I just stated, is Randall, my significant other, and my daughter, Ariel, both of whom are a constant source of support and inspiration. I am certain that my siblings would be here today if not for the restrictions due to COVID-19. I thank them for their continued love and support. I know that you have thoroughly reviewed my application and questionnaire and are familiar with my 26 years of experience in trial court, as well as my community involvement. So this morning, I would like to share the following. It was not always easy growing up the middle child of a first generation family with few resources. Although my siblings and I faced a lot of challenges, we had each other and my older siblings set high standards. They studied hard, they did well academically, and they have become well-respected professionals. I enlisted in the Army Reserves as a young adult and learned the value of teamwork and hard work. I went on to attend college and law school. When my mother died while I was in law school, my foundation was initially shaken, but the strong love of learning and the support of my siblings helped me stay on task. I graduated from law school with the knowledge that I wanted to use my degree to make a positive difference. I spent the first five years of my career in district court, initially as a probation officer and then as an assistant district attorney. While there, I quickly figured out that I love being in court and I love trying cases. From there, I applied to my current position 21 years ago and I have never looked back. Through my practice in juvenile court, I found my passion. Juvenile court is a special place where everyone has the same goal, that of helping children. As a single mother, life presented challenges and hurdles that I had to navigate, all the while maintaining a professional career. I truly believe that the challenges have made me a better person and a better lawyer. My experiences have helped me view other stories through different lenses and has reinforced a core principle, having compassion and understanding for others in all that I do. I realize, I realize and appreciate that judges can make a difference in the lives of many people. Those that come before them in court, as well as individual judges interacting from the community. The cases heard in juvenile court are complex and decisions issued by judges can have long standing implications impacting children and family for generations. I believe that I have more to contribute. If selected, I assure you that I will apply my knowledge and experience toward improving the lives of children and families while failing and impartially applying the law. I respectfully ask for your support and look forward to answering your questions. Thank you very much. Very succinct to the point. Councilor Kennedy. Good morning. Good morning. 
I get a little mad. Put it on. Put it on. Yeah. 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 That's correct. Yeah. Third. Third year. How old was your daughter? She was born. Mm -hmm. I had her um, back, uh, in January, so that would have been my last semester of law school. And uh, he, uh, I can, the, the mother must have been very proud that you went to law school. I'm sure she would be extremely proud that she would be able to see the development of the judge. I'm sure she'd also be very proud of the way you brought your daughter up. I had an opportunity to speak you. with her for a few moments before we started. Um, she's, uh, it seems like an incredible person, very good. Profession, they have a great profession. It seems to be doing a great job. So you should be proud of that. Um, coming from some difficult circumstances in life, you come a long way and you've done a great job with your daughter. Um, not everybody manages to do that. And a lot of those kids, uh, the people who don't manage to do that, end up before the juvenile court. What you have to do in the juvenile court, I think, is more important than any other judge that comes before us. And that includes the Supreme Judicial Court nominees, because you can have the biggest impact on the children, because they are children who come before you, young, young adults, actually just children. Uh, so I think it's very, very important what you're going to be doing. There's some legislation right now, and there's a lot of talk about changing the age of the juvenile court to 21, based upon a number of studies that talk about um, um, juvenile development. They really don't develop until they're in their 20s. I have a son that's 27, like your daughter. I'm not sure he's there yet, but he's working. We're working. Sure it's but, the, yeah, but it's okay. It's but the, um, but how, how do you feel about that? Changing the jurisdiction of the juvenile court. I think the SJC remanded the case recently um, to vet that in terms of whether that should change uh, with respect to things like uh, life sentences without parole for people that are between the ages of 18 and 21, whether they should be parole eligible under the, the recent case law that should be advanced more. So the criminal um, reform bill changed, increased on the younger side from seven to 12, which I absolutely agree with, that you know, a child shouldn't be involved until 12 years old. As to the- Don't you think that's a little young too? I think it's very young. A 12, 13, 14 year old being facing criminal charges, serious criminal charges. They clearly don't have the capacity to um, make decisions in court. Um, they clearly don't have the capacity to understand the ramifications of some type of plea in court, uh, some of which could, could be some on some pretty serious charges. So I, I, I hear and I understand where you're coming from. And so what I would say to you is juvenile court is probably one of the most unique courts. I have been in district court. Juvenile court, the whole purpose and goal is to try to divert, to move that child away, to and resolve the issue. So even though it is still a young age, what I find in the courts that I'm in, in the Bethany um, there's, there's a big movement towards towards diversion, keeping children. Right, but why are we even charging somebody who's 13 years old with the delinquency? Why, why are we handling that through some type of care and protection case? You follow me? I agree. I think the cases overlap. I think care and protections but, overlap. But, Usually they have a lot of the same similar issues. So I get the overlap. But, well, as a society, why are we charging a 14 year old, 13 year old with a crime? I, I understand. Shouldn't, I, it, shouldn't the juvenile court be handling it in some other, through some other method, some other way of bringing them in there without giving, giving them a record? And some juvenile court records, criminal records, do follow them for the rest of their lives. I've seen that in my practice as a criminal defense lawyer, where uh, they've had juvenile records that might keep them from getting a gun permit, for example, where they wanted to be police officers later on. Uh, they've had uh, clean records since then. Um, I've seen it with um, uh, where they're charged with second or subsequent drug cases or operating under the influence cases when they're 16 and 17 years old, where it follows them for the rest of their life. When you get down to the 13 and 14 year old range, I kind of have a big problem with even charging them with the crime. So what I'm seeing happening, at least in the court that I'm in, is under this 2018 criminal reform bill, is they're not even arraigning children. In doing the diversions beforehand, there is a family resource center that um, will 
and again, it may not deal with the serious, the more serious cases, but I'm finding that a lot of children are not being arraigned. And if they are being arraigned, then there's the opportunity now for judges to expand their record. Right. Yeah, well, if you, I understand that, but if you're in, if you're in Suffolk County, for example, in the district court in Suffolk County, um, uh, DA Rollins is uh, dismissing a lot of minor offenses prior to arraignment to keep folks from ending up with records, especially people uh, who have, have traditionally have been uh, impacted more by the criminal justice system than other folks, uh, to keep them from getting records that follow them along. But that's not across the board in the state. And it's the same thing in the juvenile court. You know, maybe in the county that you're primarily practicing, you're seeing that all the time. It's not necessarily true elsewhere. And so, number one, you get a lack of uniformity. But number two, once again, the, it, you really didn't answer my question. The question, do you think a 13 or 14 year old should ever be charged with a crime, absent maybe a murder or something like that, but don't you think that there's another way to bring, if, you, if the goal is to bring them into the juvenile court system, rehabilitate them, get them on the right track, get them in the school, get them through school, keep them out of trouble, keep them hanging around with the wrong people, whatever it is, deal with whatever the family issues are. Should that be done to a criminal case, a delinquency case? I think that if there are other opportunities that present itself, that we should look towards that. I, I do not have a problem with that. What about um, my issue with respect to folks that are between the 18, age of 18 and 21? So, changing I, the jurisdiction of the juvenile court. So, I think that the dilemmas potentially with that, I, I do think the 18 to 25 year olds, they need to be. 21, I'm saying 21 right now. I understand 21. the studies go up to 25, but right now I think what they're focusing on is potentially 18 to 21 with this, respect to all the legislation. In that, that matter that was remanded from the uh, SJC uh, to address the issue of parole eligibility for life sentences on juveniles. So I think that there's talk about doing an emergent court, uh, maybe through adults separating them out. I do think that there is reason and good thoughts to why that should be separated out. However, the concern that I have with juvenile court is you have a resource issue that you have to figure out how that would be resolved. I agree. They, and they the need more resources if they're going to expand their jurisdiction. And the second issue that I would be concerned about is what are we going to do about a 21 year old with a 12 year old? I think you have to be really careful about how you're combining. So if you, you take jurisdiction of a 21 year old and, and you combine it with a 12 year old, a 13 year old, a 14 year old, you're in really different places. I have 18 nieces and nephews from 35 to 11. I'm always conscious when Ariel's with the younger ones about think about where they are. They're in a different place mentally, physically. You just have to be very careful about how you combine them. Well, you're not combining them. You're not combining the cases, and you you can limit their inter they don't interact in the courtroom. They may be interacting in a uh, in the in the halls, and if you're talking about commitments to DYS or something like that, that's certainly something DYS can address. But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the fact that you, would you agree with me that 18 to 21 year olds' brains are not fully developed, as the studies have shown? I agree. Okay. Do you think 18 to 21 year olds who commit acts that are considered criminal in nature um, have the capacity to fully understand the consequences of their actions, given the studies that have come out? I think the studies show that they're, yes, I agree with you. That they don't they sometimes can't really understand that age okay so why are we treating them as adults why are we taking them into the adult court system and potentially putting them into adult jails uh, when they don't even have the capacity to really understand what's happening to them or the consequences of their actions i don't think i'm disagreeing with you i think i'm agreeing with you the question is where best would they go and where could you get those resources? So, so well, resources aside, because clearly, mm -hmm. if the legislature changes the law mm -hmm. to increase the jurisdiction of juvenile court to 21, mm -hmm. and as I understand it, that's the proposal. Do you want, is that yes. your understanding? Uh, they have to give the resources to support that. So, let's assume that they, when they, when they, if they change the jurisdiction, with that goes the resources. Maybe that comes out of the district court that has fewer cases as a result of that. Uh, 
But assuming that the resources is there, do you feel that those cases should be handled in the juvenile court as opposed to adult court? I think it's not a bad idea. Okay. Now, with respect to with respect to um, youthful offenders, you haven't done a lot of criminal delinquency cases in the juvenile court. Is that correct? Not directly. That's correct. That's my recollection from the conversation we yes. had on the phone. We spoke for quite a while on the phone. Yes, we did. Yeah. And um, uh, most of your work, because of the nature of your current position, has been uh, care and protection type cases. That is correct. But as you indicate, there's often an overlap. That is correct. Have you done any delinquency cases? I have not done any delinquency cases directly. However, when I do care and protections, there's often crossover. There is often times where the children on the case are involved with some type of criminal activity, sometimes the parents also with adult criminal activity, and there's often CRA. So there's often an intersectionality that I see happening with those cases. So for example, I just had a case where a young man went on an excursion at a residential placement program. And unfortunately, one of the children were jumping off the bridges. They somehow got diverted from what they were originally doing. And there was a child that was ended up dying. The young man that I received a phone call on Monday that he was being asked to be interviewed. Understanding, although I don't directly deal with delinquency cases, that juveniles, Miranda, not you know, needing an interested adult, I filed a motion for GAL. I needed to make sure that he was appointed a GAL to look out for him. I also needed him to be appointed a criminal lawyer so that when he went to the grand jury, he would not put himself in any type of harm's way. I, and I think that was wise. That, that happens often. Um, so are you familiar with the youthful offender statute? Yes. And you understand that the youthful, for the sake of the folks that might be listening, youthful offenders are basically where a, uh, a juvenile could be somebody even under the age of 17, would be under the current uh, 17 and under, uh, can get charged with serious offenses mm -hmm. in adult court and receive adult prison sentences. Um, the, do you think that in, in the decision as to whether they get charged as youthful offenders, as I understand it, is completely up to the prosecutor, correct? I believe it is. Okay. It didn't used to be that way. We used to do transfer hearings where the judge would make the decision. Uh, I haven't, I don't do a lot of juvenile work in my practice. The only few cases I have had in the last 15 or 20 years have been youthful offender cases. Um, so I, I, not too many regular delinquency cases. But um, do you think that prosecutors should be the ones to, who decide whether people are charged with the kids are charged as, as adults you think that should be left up to the judges at the hearings similar to what we used to do so again i do think that the district attorney has a lot of discretion but i think under this reform 2018 reform bill i think that there is opportunities for the judge um, to for example if there is no probable cause um, the judge can and have dismissed cases I think that there's discretion for... Well, they can always do that. Yes. Whether it's in juvenile court, district court, superior court, if there's no probable mm -hmm. cause for the crime, you can bring a motion and get it dismissed. Yes. I don't know if that, I don't know if they have the discretion to do that if there is probable cause. Mm -hmm. So let's assume for the sake of my question, if there's probable cause to potentially indict somebody. I'm not talking about on a murder. I that that's an automatic under the statute. The but let's say, a gun case. You have a kid that's uh, 16 or 17 years old, and it's not uncommon um, in this day and age, unfortunately, for kids to get in trouble by getting a gun for whatever reason, okay? Especially in poorer communities, right? We see that over and over. Uh, no other record, but yet some DA decides, well, it's a gun, I'm indicting it. Um, and that has serious ramifications for that person going forever in their life, okay? Do you think that that should be something that the VA should just be able to indict without looking at, talk about children again, without looking at the children and their whole circumstance? And, you know, which, uh, to me, a juvenile court judge after uh, hearing evidence and hearing things about their kid, 
would be in a better position than the person prosecuting to decide what's best for the kid. Because that's what we're talking about, right? Yes. I don't, I do not think that the, the that the judge has discretion as far as being able to prevent a district attorney from. No, they don't. No, they don't. So, so what I think, should they? Uh, I think, I think it's, I think it's always best if a judge can have as much discretion as possible. Well, you're going to be sitting in equal defendant cases eventually, probably not right away, because they're still heard by a juvenile court judge. Mm -hmm. um, and you're going to be sitting there with a 16 or 17 year old that may be convicted of a serious crime. Are you going to be prepared to send somebody who we know doesn't have the capacity based on the studies um, to appreciate the wrongfulness of their actions or the consequences? Are they going to be prepared to send somebody like that to state prison or house of correction? I think it depends on the particular facts of each case. I think these cases are really fact specific driven combined with analyzing the law to make, and then again, what I understand is there's a lot of pre-sentencing where you can ask for a report and look at um, the details of that child's life to make the best decision possible at that, at that point. Okay, we're talking about a 17 year old kid of the Bristol County House of Corrections. So I think if there's ways to divert a child, to, and again, I. Not knowing the specific of the facts, I think it's the gun case. We got a, we got a seventeen year old kid with a high capacity weapon, uh, and I'm seeing those all over the place these days. Uh, uh, and who, with no other record that the prosecutor down in Bristol County or whatever county decide, you know what, it's a gun. I'm indicting, and it's a one year mandatory minimum sentence. It's actually two and a half. The SJC says one because uh, of problems with the statute, but. Uh, that's written, it's going to happen. Uh, how are you going to feel about sending a 17 year old kid with no record to the House of Corrections? So, if there's an opportunity, or a 16 year old, so kid. depending on the particular facts, I, I think, I I think it's terrible any child has to go to, 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 go to jail even before court. But I think if there's, it depends on the particulars of the facts of, of that child. If there's a I can situation, get the facts. So no record, he's in school, he's doing, he gets indicted, he's doing well. Um, he's going to get convicted. He's going to go to the House of Corrections for a year. And we know he doesn't have the capacity, based on the scientific studies, to appreciate the wrongfulness of what he's doing or, or fully understand it. So I think, depending on the particulars, you can do either. There's alternatives. It doesn't always have to be the House of Corrections. But I do think that there is a balancing of trying to determine the particulars of that case, the child, um, and what would work best as far as determining. Not deterrent, I apologize, as far as rehabilitation versus protecting of the community. I think that that, that is something that you, you try to balance um, for each case. Okay. Um, I have read through all of your stuff, all the material, and I, uh, as I indicate, spent a long time talking on the phone. Very nice conversation. Appreciate you speaking with me. Uh, I'm very, very impressed with, with the letters that were written on your behalf. For a while, I thought we were going to canonize you today as opposed to uh, hold the hearing with you should be a judge based on those letters. Um, so uh, I have no, I think you are highly qualified. I don't even think, I don't even think it's close. And I congratulate uh, the governor, Lieutenant Governor, for nominating you. Uh, and I will be voting for you next week. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Kennedy. We're going to go, uh, we're going to switch off, go to the web webinar people now. Uh, Councilor Ionella. Uh, uh, Council, thank you very much, Councilor. I had a lengthy conversation with you, Councilor. I think it was last weekend. And she answered all my questions. I think she's going to be a superb addition to the juvenile court. I have no questions. Uh, like I said, it was a great conversation that we both had. I hope I didn't ruin your weekend. Um, but next week, when uh, whenever the next meeting is, when your name uh, comes before us, I know uh, your counselor, Councilor Ferrara, is a strong supporter of yours. I will be more than happy to support your nomination. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Ionella. Can I, can I just add that Councilor Ferrara is a huge supporter of yours. He spoke to me uh, about your nomination before. He's just, you know, a huge, huge supporter. Thank you. My arms hurt. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you.
So, so far, I can count three votes. Let's see if we can get four. Councilor Jubinville, you're next. We're going to get four. You think there's uh, systemic, systemic, systemic racism in the courts? Yes. You don't? No, I said yes. yes. So, what are we going to do about that? There are many ways to, to work on it. First of all, I'm a firm believer in education. I think talking about it is the first step, acknowledging that it exists. Um, then I think that there's training that can happen. I think there is, um, you know, in changing what it looks like, um, adding people at many different layers from many different backgrounds. Um, that's just the beginning. What kind of education do you need to make somebody understand that they're being a racist with certain people in our court system? Okay, so here's my expl explanation that I, I used. There are Archie Bunkers. Archie Bunker is simple. Archie Bunker is simple. I don't like you because you're black. I don't like you because you're uh, Jewish. I don't like you because you're a woman. That's simple. I don't think the problem is people saying, I am out to get you. That's not what's happening. What's happening is, and I'll give you a personal example that happens to me uh, probably in a couple of years. I, I think what happens is uh, people have good intentions, but they're not understanding or processing what, how best to get, to get there. So one of the things that happens with me pretty regularly is that I'm often um, told, you're black and you're a woman, you'll get the job wherever you go. That is just a presumption. Now, on its face, that's not anyone trying to purposely be mean or angry or, or say something bad to me. But if your thought process is similar to that, then that means whenever there's an opportunity open or, a, or anything open, you're gonna, audit, you're gonna say, oh, I don't have to give it to her, she'll get it anyway. So what I do is I don't argue with people about that, because folks, again, there's not someone saying, you know, I'm Archie Bunker. So what I say is, okay, let's assume your premise, that if I'm black and I'm female, and that's the only criteria that I must have, then, I, then would it have it be built? And that usually at least gives a person a, 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 a moment to think. So when I say education, it's about saying to, to folks, we're all in here for the right reasons. Everybody wants to make a good change and wants to see an inclusive environment. How are we going to get there? How and how do I get you to think about doing things a little bit differently, processing things a little bit differently? Um, so I hope I answered your question. Well, there's no saying the road to hell is paved with good intentions. That's true. So to me, um, I, I don't know how you teach somebody to not be. A racist, a racist, and somebody that says you got a job because of the color of your skin, or because of your your sexual orientation. To me, that that's a racial put down. It may be a subtle one, but it is. Um, have you known any? You don't have to give me their names, but have you known any judges that you thought were racist? that treated black people or brown people differently than white people? So I don't think that there is, I have never experienced a judge saying, I'm going to do this because that person's black. Well, well, I think well, well, nobody is going to say that, he went back, ever. Well, if you went back 20, 30 years. I now, I've been practicing law for 42 years and I've been in the court for almost 50. Okay. I have never heard anyone say, I sentenced somebody or I found somebody guilty because of the color of their skin or because of their sexual orientation or because of that, that is never going to be said. Um, I think more importantly, it's, it's the actions of people in a subtle way that are the, um, the, the, the problem. I mean, you could put every judge in a convention room and ask them, you know, are you a racist? Everyone's going to say no. 
So, I mean, you, you've been in the court system for quite a while. You said you believe there is some sort of systemic racism, right? Yes. And I agree with you. There is. Well, why do you think 50% of the people in our jails are, are minorities? It's because they get treated differently. But they get treated differently in their communities, they get more of a record, they get brought into court more than white kids would be brought in in Wellesley or Weston or Milton, the town I live in, Milton. So then when they come up before a judge, they've got a record. Sometimes couple of things on their record. So they get sentenced harder, which is a subtle form of racism, in my opinion. So how do we, how do we uh, get judges to think otherwise? How do we get them out of that mode? Again, the education, the training, the, the having people take pause and think about, again, I think in juvenile court, is that the reform bills, which is a good start of how to, Let's let's stop, pause, and think about what it is that we're trying to do for these children. And for example, what you said, like a record. So then that if someone has a prior record and they're coming from a particular community, you get to weigh out factors and you consider that factor and think about that and maybe not um, rely on that as heavily. Well, we went from a system in juvenile court where juveniles were thrown into prisons with grown adults and then there was all kinds of reform for juveniles and we made a lot of headway at one point in our system that anybody under the age of 18 had got convicted of a murder charge in the juvenile court where they had murder trials first degree murder you were punished by 15 years second degree you were punished by 10 years you remember that I don't remember that, but I know that the case law has moved and shifted towards what you're referring to, understanding that there's a ch children need an opportunity not to have place without the possibility of parole, that the children, because their minds are not developed, have the ability to reform and change who, the, who they are. Um, so yes, I agree with that. I mean, can you imagine putting a uh, somebody under the age of 18 in state prison? I think that that is very tough. Tough. You guarantee, and he's going to come out a criminal worse than he went in. He's yes. going to be raped. He's going to be used for sexual favors. Um, do we have any? Um, you know this question, do we have any more truant officers? Do you know, do you know what that is? Um, they have officers with the school departments, but they call truancy officers. So they, my understanding is their job is to try to encourage a child to go to school. Right, go yes. find kids that aren't in school. Yes. They still have that? They do. You think, you think we should have police schools? I think, so I think there's a move away. I, I agree with the move away towards taking the, um, the police officer. So your answer is you don't agree with the police That is correct. Okay. I think most things in schools can be handled by teachers, can't they? I agree. I mean, when I went through schools, there were fights, there were all kinds of things that went on and you were brought down to the principal's office and there was a uh, vice principal usually that was in charge of discipline. One for the boys, one for the girls. And they handle all that stuff. Um, Council Kennedy talked about whether or not uh, judges or DA should have certain types of discretions. I didn't really get your, your opinion on that. You're sitting as a judge and in certain cases, you don't have any discretion, the DA does. Mm -hmm. That's the case, then why do we need you? I, if I didn't answer it, I will clarify. I think 
judges in juvenile court should have discretion about who is everything. That is my position. I also, but I do recognize that they do not ask to some factors. But I do think that the more discretion a judge can have in juvenile, particularly in juvenile court, the better off um, the entire system is, particularly towards that child. Um, so you have a, a background of, I think, a very diverse background, very good background to be a judge. You've held a lot of positions in your young life, all of them positions related to children in some way. I like the fact that you got a degree in psychology. More judges should have that. Um, so I, I think your background is very impressive, and I think you've, you've earned whatever you've gotten and worked your way up in our system. So all those things are good. The fact that you're a veteran of the Army, another experience you went through, it makes you what you are today. I did receive calls from Judge uh, Foley. She called me up, I think, 10 minutes after you were publicly nominated. Uh, Angelo Legati, assistant clerk in the juvenile court, but thinks the world of you. Uh, Judge Harrington also called me. And Rebecca Jones Bloom called me from, she lives in Dedham, I think. Yes. And she said she has worked with you over the years and, and uh, wanted to call me and let me know that. So I appreciate all of those calls and I take those people that I know. I like the fact that they called me and gave me such a glowing recommendation for you. It meant, meant a lot to me. So I have no other questions for you. I'm going to vote for you. I think you're going to be a fine judge. And uh, take care of the kids that come before you, will you? I will. Thank you. You shouldn't be going into prison because they're not coming out where they went in. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Julio. Councilor Hurley, Springfield, how are you feeling these days? I'm feeling much better. And I had uh, the talking to our nominee. And we had a lot of discussions about juvenile issues. Um, she didn't tell me about her daughter. That was a big mistake. If I wasn't for you before, which I was, after discussions, I certainly would have been after I found out what a great job you did on raising your own child. So of all your accomplishments, so of all your accomplishments, of all your Hang on, Councilor Hurley. We have a little problem hearing you. Uh, we heard of all your accomplishments. That's the last thing we heard. And then nothing else. Hang on. I try to unmute you here, I believe. No, I don't know if you can hear me, but stand by for one minute, please. Councilor, um, don't touch the computer. Keep it like that and try to speak. T test, test the audio right now. So, of all your accomplishments. <laughs> I would say that is the best yeah, and the greatest. The best and the greatest. I told you, I told the people who called me on your behalf that I was very impressed. I think you're going to do a great job. And we'll be voting for you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councilor Duff. Oh, and one more thing. One more thing. Yes. Councilor Ferrara, Ferrara twisted both my twisted arms. Both my arms. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. I hope you're well. Councilor Duff. Thank you, Councilor. 
Uh, good, good to actually see you. I hope you can see me, Attorney uh, Gomes. I want to say one thing before I ask you any questions. Um, I personally, and this is not aimed at anyone on the council, but I find it offensive when those of us, um, frankly, who are white and come from white privilege are asking people of color, how how do we, um, or how are we supposed to make people not racist? I don't really think that's your responsibility. And, and I wanna be clear on that. I, I find that offensive when people ask people of color, how are white people not supposed to be racist? It's up to white people to figure that out. Um, we've had hundreds and hundreds of years in this country to, to work on it. We're still working on it. We're doing better. But um, that's our work. That's not your work. So um, I, I want to be real clear. I, I That's just to me out of bounds to be asking you that. Um, but that said, uh, we need people of color. We need women. We need people with your life experience. Um, but as you and I discussed, because we spoke for a long time and we could have gone on and on and on, um, how how are, uh, how have you prepared yourself? Um, and when I say this, I don't just mean intellectually, because you clearly have the intellect and the experience, but I find this to be one of the most difficult courts to be sitting in. Um, how, what do you have for support, family support, spiritual support? Tell me a little bit about that, because I can imagine at the end of the day, already with the work you do, you go home sometimes just, you know, shaking your head. Um, yet being the judge, it, it's a hard job. Um, judges today, I believe, are asked to be uh, not just the judge, but but the nurse and the doctor and the rabbi and the priest and the social worker and the teacher. Um, and, and it's something that concerns me, is everything that we put on our judges today. Can you share a little bit with me if, if you've thought about that and what your support would be? So just for you to know, for me, this job is working with children is beyond important. So for me, it is very important um, that I contribute to this world in a positive manner, particularly towards you. And the support I have are sitting, two of them are sitting right here. I have the most amazing, uh, intelligent, smart, young Smith graduate who keeps me um, always thinking forward, always how do you do things better? I have my significant other, Randall, who will come home and if it's a really horrible day, I'll say, I just need to go for a walk, I don't wanna talk. And he will walk with me and he'll walk beside me and kind of let me take the lead. I have six siblings that are just absolutely amazing. They, um, we range in 10 years and they have all different backgrounds, but the one thing we have is about how do we support each other. So I talk to people, I go to the gym, uh, I talk to my family, I talk to the ones I love and I go to the gym. Now, I think that's terrific because um, it's, as you and I discussed before, judges, we have an independent judiciary and there's a reason why. And the public doesn't always agree or like the decisions, neither do I, frankly, sometimes. But when it branches into uh, incivility and threats against people because we don't like or understand the decision. And this, frankly, cuts across any political lines as far as I'm concerned. Um, it's, it's just, to me, something that shouldn't be done. Um, and I don't mean you can't disagree with somebody. I mean how you project that, protest somebody else, harassing them, uh, that sort of thing. It's just, it's against our democracy. and. Uh, Yet, you need to be prepared on how you will deal with that. Um, what, I was also thrilled to see that you went to Howard University. Um, I had the, had the pleasure of going to college in Washington, DC, spent a little bit of time on Howard campus, but the law school there, I'm not sure some of my brethren understand uh, how good how it is. And you said something to me that I've thought about a lot is that people think you said Harvard. Well, in many ways, it's frankly a little bit uh, tougher and harder to get into than Harvard. It's a much smaller university. 
Um, I think there's only 50 students in a section. Um, it is it is one of the real elite schools. Uh, it's traditionally a school of, of people of color. Um, although I did date a, a white guy who went there, <laughs> who was on the baseball team. Um, but it's uh, it's a fabulous, fabulous school. And if you're comfortable, would you share a little bit about what your experience was like um, coming from from where you went to high or uh, to college, and then into a, a community like Washington D.C. and did it in, impact you at all? Did it form you? And and if you're comfortable sharing, please, I'd like to hear it. I will. Um, so, so I went, went to, to UMass Amherst, Amherst undergrad, which was a wonderful experience. Twenty thousand students, and you learn about tie dyes, and your classes are 200, 300 um, individuals. And you look to your left and look to your right. You're told at UMass, um, look to your left and look to your right because students won't graduate. Um, so it is a wonderful experience. And then I went to Howard, which was as about as opposite as possible. You walked into the university and knew your name from day one. And you did the Socratic method. You stood up and you um, answered questions for hours upon hours. And one of the things that Howard University taught me, and which is part of you know, Thurgood Marshall, a lot of wonderful people graduated, impressive people graduated from Howard is that you would be a social engineer, that your degree is not just about you. It is about how you can go use that degree to help the world, help your society, help your community. And so um, that is my experience. And Howard was a very different, uh, DC, Washington DC was wonderful, wonderful experience, multicultural, um, you, you would go many places and not even um, know half the languages. It's just a it's very great. Great. It's a great. I, as you know, lived in D.C. and went to college there. I think it's one of the greatest experiences in the world that anyone can have, uh, particularly Americans. So, um, and in fact, you know, thinking about it, I don't recall seeing many and many uh, Howard Law School grads sitting where you're sitting. So, so good for you. I'm curious if you're the first since I've been here. Um, you have a great background. I was particularly, uh, as we discussed a little bit, interested in your DC law experience in the landlord tenant court, having been a landlord in DC for many years. Um, although that's not really what, what you'll be doing here. Um, you have a great breadth of experience. Would you be willing, uh, once, if you go to the bench, of going back into the schools, particularly public schools in your area, and talking to students about your life experiences in, in your journey to the bench? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I, I have brought a couple of judges um, to, to, to schools, Judge Lowy and Judge Bud, both on the state Supreme Court, went to Peabody High School, where I graduated from. And they, they came and did a wonderful presentation uh, with the students. We were about to do another presentation with some other judges when, they, when the COVID hit. Um, but I have to tell you, um, and Judge Lowy was there when I was there, although I didn't know him. But the one that made such a huge impact and frankly, a life changing impact on the students was Kim Budd, Judge Budd, be, because of her story and uh, having been one of the only people of color at Peabody High when she was there, but also her ascension to, to the bench. Um, the students were completely mesmerized. And I had um, seeing her having having a woman and having a woman of color in the room speaking to these students had an impact far beyond i think what any of us anticipated to the degree that i actually got messages from parents i'd never met saying thank you so much you changed my child's life and what you've said earlier about being in this court and how important children are i you know i have no kids. I have no biological children. I don't have any adopted kids. But I do feel as an elected official that I have a responsibility for every single child in this commonwealth and that I should be held to a higher standard to protect them in any possible way that I can. And that's why people like you are so very important because you have the opportunity to change the trajectory of someone's life. 
And I see that not just as you sitting on the bench, but I'm asking more of you, as I've asked many judges, if you feel confident, not that you wouldn't be confident, but if you, if you feel that you'd be willing to go and speak to some of these students, particularly in areas where we, we have more people of color, um, in women, young girls, it really doesn't matter what color they are. It's so important for them to see you. To, it's astounding to me when I hear of people as accomplished as you are and as intelligent as you are. And, and you didn't say this, but other people have said to me, I never thought I could do that. Um, we, we, need to sh we need to show by example and, and by mirroring. And so thank you for that commitment. Um, I'm, I could belabor this conversation with you right now, which I'm not going to. You're more than qualified. You, you are applying for this job. You've entered the, the, the law, the field of law, for all the exact right reasons that, that I hope and pray as a citizen that people do. Um, I think you're very, very intelligent, but you have a humbleness about you. Um, at the same time being self-assured that is such a rare combination to see today. And I would like to deeply thank you for your application to the court. And I'd like to thank Counsel Fiera because I understand that he was somebody who championed you uh, privately before uh, you had maybe even thought of it. Because unfortunately, women, and I'm sure it applies more to you because I am just a short little white lady, uh, we have to be asked a lot more times to do something. And so thank you. And anything that you can do to help us be better, um, I deeply appreciate. And so um, that is all I have to say. Thank you for your application. And um, congratulations to, to Randall, your significant other, and to Ariel, the Smithy. Uh, I'm jealous of that. I went to an all women's college. I don't know. I would have gotten into Smith. She's a smart cookie um, it, for, for being uh, your support. Thank you very much. Thank well, you. Thank, thank you, Councilor Duff. And for the record, uh, the first time I met the nominee, I was the guest speaker um, at a women's bar association meeting. I was put together by a Somerset person, a lawyer, uh, Sharon Puccini Sullivan. So we have to give Sharon credit for making us meet each other yes. and from that point on as we did seminars um, i highly encourage you and i'm so glad mm -hmm. i couldn't be happier um i think you're an awesome candidate um but i'll talk about that a little bit more council jewel will ask to speak for one minute and then we're going to go to council yeah Tuesday. since council duff criticized me on the question i asked i want to i want to make it uh, very plain that i think racism is a cancer on our society it affects everybody in our society, those who commit it and those who suffer from it. And by talking to everybody, getting everybody idea, uh, ideas on it, I think is the only chance we have to cure this cancer on our society. Thank you. Council of Petito Debating. Uh, thank you. Um, you're always consistent. You always call me last. Thank you. You're the best for last. Uh, yeah, OK. <laughs> um, Nice to see you again. And I want to thank you. Four hours we met, and we saw the clock. Four hours. And so um, it was really a pleasure to meet you. Um, I just want to make this very clear. This was not about a pandemic, not having a witness. We have your partner and your daughter here that are in this room, OK? And uh, no me, one can, excuse me, me, no, 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 one, me. no one can I'm gonna answer. Ask you, I'm going to ask you to ask Could, nominee questions about her fitness to sit on the court. We're not um, talking about witnesses appearing. There are no witnesses. We're not gonna, uh, there is we're not no, talk about there, there's no answer to the question if why we, questions, we could know. allow people to come in to witness you as your um, partner and daughter, but we can't have a witness. Not one council can do that, and I stand on that. I want to say, uh, no one, uh, no one, excuse me, no one on this council is more concerned with pandemic. My sister died, my sister died in a, in a, a uh, not only, not even three weeks ago in a nursing home alone. 
No one cares more than pandemic. This is not about a pandemic. Sorry. And I have a sister, for the record, I have a sister that's struggling with coronavirus also in, um, in the, uh, in the, excuse me, um, in the, uh, if she is in assisted living, please don't be rude. I try to be polite. Okay, first of all, I'd like to, I'd like to ask you, excuse me, I'd like to ask you, I'd like to ask you, uh, some of the questions. Let's take. Let's take. I have questions. I, I call the top of Kennedy. I'm chairing the meeting. Either you let him speak, or we're going to suspend the meeting. I have questions. It's I my turn. But you can't go on about I'm. I'm done. I'm done. Okay, I've said what I have to. to. The uh, it's my turn to ask board. questions, please. Board. You've already spoken. The science has shown more people move, the more dangerous it is for people to get infected, and not just the people in the room, but other people. Are you asking then, questions? Point of order. People in the room, I'm answer answer your that. question about why it's about a pandemic. The more people in the room it is, the more dangerous, not just to the folks that are here, but to everybody else out in the world that could get infected, which is one person coming in here. So everybody knows, that's why we had limits for a while of 10 people gathered. Based on science, that's why we have limits of 25 people. Now it's up to 100 people outside, but we still have to limit the number of people going to restaurants. We still have to limit the number of people going to movie theaters. The only thing we're doing here by not having witnesses is have as few people as possible in the room to protect the public safety and the safety of everybody in this room, counselors and everybody else. Now, that's the reason for that. Thank it's you, that Councilor. Simple. Thank you, Councilor Kennedy. Council of we'll go back to you. And please limit your questions to her fitness to be a judge. Thank you. Um, I hope that the people that have come will be safe, and I welcome you two people to come. Thank you. Um, first of all, um, I, I always like to ask the nominee the process of how you got here. So um, I just want to ask you, um, you went to the JNC, Judicial Nominating Commission. For people who don't know that, the Judicial Nominating Commission are 21 lawyers who have more authority than any governor's counselor because they are the, the committee who chooses whether they're going to interview you or not and whether they're going to recommend you to the governor and then the governor rec recommends you to us. We have no knowledge of how many apply. We only have one person that comes before us. So. Um, I just want to ask you, those 21 people have an awesome responsibility to recommend to the governor. How many of those 21 lawyers were there? My recollection is there were approximately 11 individuals, and there was uh, two other sessions, I believe, happening at the same time. No, you're, you're, I'm talking about your, your, your interview. Uh, approximately 11 people, and I think there may have been one person on the phone in addition. So there was how many? 10? Uh, between, it was anywhere between 10 and 12. 10 and 12, okay. The point is that there's 11 people, the point is that there's 11 people that voted for you to recommend to the, recommend to the governor to be a judge. Never saw you, never talked to you. I just wanna make that point. And believe me, it has nothing to do with your ability, please know that. Now, um, I'm going to go through, and we talked about this, so let me go through uh, this housekeeping kind of stuff. First of all, um, you had answered a lot of NA, non-applicable. I know, I know that, I, I would say every one of them except one was no, but I still don't know why, and I just wanted to correct that for the record, because, um, you know, some of them are so obvious, and, and I... You know, I had said to you, I, I questioned why you would put uh, not applicable when they were yes and no. For example, um, for example, um, have you ever been denied admission to the bar of any state due to failure to pass the character of fitness screening? I know it's a no, but you put in a, okay? Have you ever been discharged from employment or whatever? Okay, no. so I just want to go through them just for your benefit to know that it, you know this is what it is. Okay, um, have you ever served as master or arbitrator? Not applicable. That is applicable. Did yes or no? 
The answer would be no. Okay. And I apologize. Um, have you ever served as um, an administrator, executor, trustee, receiver, or any other fiduciary capacity? The answer is no. Okay. Have you ever served on any bar association referral panel, criminal justice panel, legal aid, public defender, board of directors in the last five years? The answer is no. Okay. And um, yeah, I don't, I don't want to go all through all of them. There, there was quite a few. Um, uh, uh, one of them was um, about, have you ever uh, done any pro bono? And it said, if not, explain. And, and you said not applicable. So could you just explain that answer? So the answer is no. And I apologize because I just put not applicable if I didn't think because I work for the state government, I am not allowed to do pro bono work. I see. So that is why the answer is no. I see. Okay. And and then we talked about, and you did say, um, you know, on your contributions, and um, you know, it's fine you, that you had given. Um, one hundred and eighty five dollars to uh, your district counselor, and you explained that. So I, those are the, the the you know the housekeeping things I have um, to say. Um, I'm not going to go. You had some other non applicable, but uh, you know I know they were no. But I but I, I just couldn't figure out why you know because other question other nominees always put yes or no, but that's okay. It doesn't affect anything to do with you. So uh, let that go. Um, now. Um, I first want to tell you, and I think when we met, I told you, the juvenile court is the most important court to me. And especially with all the child abuse and all the things that are going on in our society. Um, and, um, and I volunteered. I volunteered counseling juveniles on probation for almost a year, years ago. And that was the greatest experience I ever had. Because I have four children, and I had no idea about juveniles in their lives and what they go through. You know, they're not all juvenile delinquents, let's be realistic. And um, I would meet them one-on-one, -on -one, take that per person out to lunch and, the, you know, that child and really get to know them. And I understand a little bit, not all of your responsibility because it really is amazing what you do, but I could, you know, understand what this child was going through that I would have never, ever had known if I didn't volunteer. And uh, I would find out that one of the girls that I was seeing locked in a room, mother was a prostitute, and that's the kind of life she lived. Or someone that just abused, sexually abused, or whatever. And I learned so much. And I think, for me, the most important appointment to me is to get the right person in the juvenile court. And I don't have a poker face. And I am so pleased with your experience. And everyone knows my one priority is empathy and compassion. And um, you know, you've had some tough cases here. Um, I guess what I am most concerned about is when you have a case that you know that the child is being abused and yet they put the child back in that home and then they're removed again that bothers me um how many removals have you had that I dealt with? would you say hundreds yeah and um how many trials would you have? i don't have an exact number yeah i would say hundreds of trials. yeah um you know, um, some of these cases are just heartbreaking. And, um, you know, when you have a child removed after, you know, the boyfriend has sexually molested the child and everything, do you follow up to see that that child gets the proper, um, you know, um, services that's needed? So I think it depends on the particular families. Some families, when I deal, I deal with usually the more tough cases, the cases that have come to court. So it depends on the particular family. From the I live in the community uh, that I work, so often I run into children, families, and some folks want to share and will approach me and say, 
you know, I'm doing well, this is happening. Other families do not want to share, do not want to even disclose. So it just depends on the typical family. Do you, in your opinion, do you think the age should be increased for the a, a juvenile court? So this would be the upper age of 18 to 21. I think it just it would depend on you know, is, is there adequate resources for the juvenile court? You know, because there is a resource, I can see a resource issue, and I can also see an issue with making sure the children of different ages are not, lack of a better term, called the 21 and 14. Well, you know, I, I have a strong opinion about that. And and I feel that the juvenile court is overworked enough and they couldn't take more on. Do you agree if you age, if you increase that age? Okay. The other thing is, I mean, we have seen in these recent years juveniles are murdering people. They're raping people. So um, you know, I'm always tired of hearing someone that comes to the hearing too, that we'll talk about that um, the mind, the brain, whatever the mind, mind is not developed until 25. And I keep saying, I had four children before I was 25. My mind was developed. I think that is a fallacy and I don't know why they keep using it. And, um, you know, uh, I, I just think that um, the age is appropriate for the juvenile court. And I hope that they've already increased it, right? Haven't they just this past year so or two? If there are children who turn 18 years old after care and protection, what I think is really awesome about the court now is you can stay from 18 to 22. So we can assist in young folks <coughs> schooling, housing, anything they need. So I think that's been a remarkable Yeah. Um, the um you know i'm looking at some of these cases and um as i've always said the one thing that i find difficult is you can't put every single um issue into your j and c and it's always left that it's going to be appealed or it's continuing so i never know the rest of the story you know what i mean so um you know um the other thing is um you know, this case I, I was concerned about, it was the, um, uh, let me say, it, it was um, mm -hmm. Tom Sniffen, Nancy Harmon with, with the children. That was about the mother who lost custody of her children because she was involved in the execution of a search warrant for narcotics with her boyfriend and um, you know, she had, um, oh, I mean, she had gone through a lot of abuse from him, but uh, on the other hand, she had been involved in drugs and so forth. And so um, it ended up that they were returned to her care and the matter was dismissed. And, and you know, I, I just, you know, I just couldn't figure how that happened, what, how you decide, how that was decided, you know? I think what happens is the parents are given an opportunity um, in any care protection case to resolve the issues, work with the department, do services, and she did. She turned it around. She had supports in places, and I think that's why the case was dismissed. And her children were done. Um, what changes do you think are needed in the um, in the juvenile court right now? So I think what would be really what I've seen improve and, and we should continue with is identifying kinship homes. So we have we still have a very big shortage of finding appropriate homes for children. Um, I think there's been a move towards identifying kin, family, friends, supports, and having that mm -hmm. um, increase. Um, and finding the appropriate home for children in the venue for the cases would be very helpful so that children don't have to go to foster care. So um, we all know drugs, drug addiction is so involved in this, right? Um, and I keep saying it goes nowhere. We need more drug. We talked about that when we met at drug uh, treatment centers, especially for women. We only have one. and and. Um, so uh, what do you think about the drug courts? I think, I think 
anything to help people um, resolve issues, which always is a big issue and helpful. So I would be just a little bit. I went to a drug uh, graduation, drug court graduation, and I'll tell you, tears came to my eyes to hear one right after the other, these people who had gone through the drug court and had, who had been drugs, been on drugs for decades and how it changed their lives. And to see them hug the judge, I mean, it was very emotional for me. And I just thought, I, I wish people knew how valuable they are because we think some of these specialty courts have no value and they really, really do, you know? Um, you know, for, for, for the ones I saw, I just was, it was just very impressive. Um, now, uh, there was a, a case here that uh, was involved with, let me see, um, something like 2151 A's and 1051 B's. For people who are watching this, or whoever, if they are, would you explain the difference? Sure. 51A report is a report that comes in if you're coming from a school teacher, if you're coming from a police officer. It is the allegation that um, a family is in trouble, drug involved, it could be arrest. So there, that is the actual um, allegation. The 51B is the actual investigation that's done by the Department of Children and Families. It has to be done within a certain time frame, and that investigator is supposed to speak with child family review records speak with police officers whomever they need to to uh, determine whether or not these allegations are actually um substantiated or should be substantiated but tell me why does it go to that extent 21 21 and, and it still goes on why isn't it why you know isn't it terminated that children taken away why is it the children are suffering i don't understand why it that, that's years and years why is that i think each case is, is individually and factually dependent upon so so i deal with hundreds of care protections each case is factually and specifically driven so again um I do think that the law says, um, and you're obligated to give parents the reasonable opportunity to resolve the issue. And if they can't, then you need to look to promises of children, which can include uh, termination of parental rights, adoption, guardianship, or others. I see. Um, you know, uh, you know I, I had a lot of questions, but again, I'm always last, and I don't like to keep you know the nominee any longer. Uh, but I, I have to tell you that um, I was so impressed with your resume. Because, um, you know, um, as I said, compassion and empathy, and you have it. But, it, you know, it goes further than that. You had experienced, uh, you know, and I like your age. I don't like to see someone 40 that's going to be there for 30 years. I really believe we need judges who have life experience. And you are bringing life experience. And we talked about it. We had a lot in common that we went to college. I went with four children. You had child. I mean, it's not easy, you know. And so the, I really appreciate and I want to thank you for your, um, uh, you know, for, for serving uh, in the um, military. Um, and, and you kind of downplayed it because it wasn't, you know, active military. But uh, you served. And I thank you for that. Um, you know, it's um, for me. It's, it is so, um, you know, we see, I see people that come through that don't have the qualifications, okay? Six cases and they go to the Superior Court in 21 years. You got 25 years. I mean, how many cases? Could you even guess how many cases you've had? I, I don't have a number, but I can say the vast amount, and they would number in the hundreds between. Yeah, criminal and civil. Well, I, I'm telling you, I, I am very pleased, and I, I wish the governor would look for more people like you, because um, I don't want to vote for someone who coached a kid or whatever. I want someone like you that is there to do the right thing, and you're not, you know, trying to, you know, uh, jump the the line. You deserve it, and I'm so glad that you were recommended, and that the governor has recommended 
you to us. And uh, I know you'll do a wonderful job and I, I wish you all good luck. And I apologize to your friend on the phone. She so wanted to come, okay? But thank you so much. I appreciate thank it. You. Thank you, Council Devaney. Um, now it's my turn. And uh, I don't have a lot to say except thank you. Um, you know, I, geez, it almost brings tears to my eyes. Just think uh, <laughs> how far you've come and what you've done and um, you know, your service to, in the military, your service as an ADA, your service as a probation officer. In your service for over 20 years to families then like it makes me feel like i'm making a little bit of difference when people like you apply because you're going to have the opportunity to change generations um in the juvenile court and i know you're going to do a superb job i can't think of a better qualified candidate than you so uh, i appreciate um all your hard work and i appreciate you your daughter and your significant other being here today and um from what I see, I think you're going to be unanimous next week. I think everyone has a pleasure of support. So uh, thank you again. Um, you're going to be a terrific judge. I'm going to conclude the hearing. Thank you.